नवतु सह नो गुणक्त सह वीर गर्वा वह तेजस्विना वितमस्तु मिद्विषा वह ओ शांति 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 Dear students, today we are going to discuss about the hip dislocations, and that too particularly the posterior hip dislocation. Now, when God designed the 65 joints in the human body, He made the hip joint very big and strong to support His weight on a biped stance. Consequently, considerable force is required to bring it out of its socket. These forces are provided. 70 to 100 percent of the times by high speed motor vehicle accidents. The dashboard injury, though hip dislocations were reported earlier to the discovery of x rays, it was first in, in 1938 that first reported a series of 20 hip dislocations and also coined the term dashboard dislocations. In a series, and in the subsequent series by other authors. It was found that these dislocations usually happen when the knee of the front seat occupant in a vehicle strikes against a dashboard of the vehicle, usually in a head-on collision. Now, depending upon the position of the limb at the time of impact, there could be either a pure dislocation or fractional dislocation. Now, the enormity of the trauma could also cause multi-system injuries, the head injury, trunk, abdomen and pelvis. Now, we have to look what could happen in the hip dislocation. There could be pure hip dislocation, that is one scenario. There could be fracture of fracture hip dislocation where there may be a fracture of fastabulum or fracture of head of the femur or fracture neck of the femur as well along with the dislocation. Then other injuries may be there like uh, knee ligament injuries, fracture patella, fracture femur, fracture shaft of the femur, etc. Now the other limb fractures includes the multi-system injuries, the pelvic fractures, the rib fractures, the spine fractures, etc. And the reason is the force required to dislocate the hip joint is enormous and that same force may lead to all these injuries. And now you, you know why managing the dislocation is a gigantic challenge to a treating orthopedic surgeon. Now depending upon the presentation, it may be a solo or a multimodality and multi-speciality approach. Nonetheless, hip dislocations are the emergency amidst the life-threatening emergencies, if any, and needs to be treated on a top priority basis. If the hip joint is out, pushing it back in should be the mantra, lest troublesome delayed complications like avian, degenerative arthritis, it is a stare at your face. Now, you must understand the clinical significance of the vascular anatomy. Our vascular necrosis of the femoral head and the post-traumatic degenerative hip are the two very important and common complications of the hip dislocation. A thorough knowledge of the vascular anatomy is must to understand the reason behind it. Femoral head circulation is through three sources. One, intraosseous cervical vessels, two, artery of ligamentum teres, and three, the retina ocular vessels. That is the main supply. Now, if there is a damage to these vessels during dislocation or during reduction and also due to the delay in diagnosis and treatment, now this could lead to the avascular necrosis of femoral head and later to the degenerative arthritis. Therefore, the aim of the treatment is early anatomical reduction to protect the existing circulation of the head of the femur. Coming to the causes for hip dislocation, it includes high speed road traffic accidents, violent falls from the height, 
and sports related injuries, the industrial accidents and natural calamities it is in. Now we, one has to note that 70 to 100 percent of the time the hip dislocations are due to the road traffic accidents. Coming to the mechanism of injury, the notorious incriminating forces that knocks the hip out of its safe confines could arise from three sources. First, the front part of the flexed knee striking against an object that is what we call as a dashboard event. Second, it could be through the sole of the feet with the ipsilateral knee extended. And third, it could be from the greater trochanter. Now, rarely it could also be from the posterior pelvis. Now, look at this interesting development in a dashboard injury. Left hip may develop a pure dislocation of the hip since the left foot is on the clutch with the hip and knee flexed at 90 degree. Right hip may develop a fracture dislocation because usually the right foot is either on a brake or an accelerator pedal with the hip in 60 to 70 degrees of flexion and slight abduction. Depending upon the position of the head with respect to the acetabulum, the hip dislocations are classified as the posterior dislocation, the head lying posterior to the acetabulum, commonest and is seen in 80 to 90 percent of the cases. Then it could be anterior dislocation. Now, because the head lies anterior to the acetabulum, it is seen in 10 to 15 percent of the cases. And finally, it could be a central dislocation, which is relatively rare because the head lies medial to the acetabulum. Now, overall classification of the head dislocation, Stavert and Milford, based on the hip stability and the femoral air conditions, both anterior and posterior, they have classified hip dislocations into four major types. Type 1, the dislocates, hip dislocates with either, with either no fracture or an insignificant acetabular rib fracture. That is type 1. Then type 2, dislocation with either a single or communized posterior wall fracture but after reduction the hip is stable that is type 2. Now type 3 fractures they say the fracture dislocation with gross instability due to the loss of structural support so even if you reduce it again gets dislocated that is type 3 and type 4 the dislocations with the femoral head fractures that is how they have classified into uh, the overall classification of the hip dislocation in four types. However, Epstein has uh, classified, given a comprehensive classification for both the anterior and posterior where he has made five groups. Type 1, again the same, no significant associated fracture, no clinical instability following the concentric reduction. However, type 2, he says, irreducible dislocation without significant femoral head or acetabular fracture. Now, he mean irreducible mean you must have tried reduction under general anesthesia at least and you were not able to reduce it because of some of the other reason. Type 3, it is an unstable head following the reduction or incasserated fragments of the cartilage, labrum or the bone. So, after reduction you have been able to reduce, however, it was not uh, stable. There was some fragment inside the joint. Type 4 is an associated acetabular fracture requiring reconstruction to restore the hip stability or the joint congruity. Type 4, the associated femoral head or femoral neck injury, the fractures, uh, it may be a fracture, it may be an impaction. Now, this type 5 is further subdivided. Now, the posterior hip dislocation, let us discuss in detail. As mentioned earlier, this is the most common variety of hip dislocation. The dislocation could be simple or may be associated with the fracture dislocations. Thompson and Epstein have further classified the posterior dislocation of the hip into four types. And Pipkin has given four subclassification for the femoral head fractures in the type 4b 
variety of the uh, Thomson and Epstein variety. Now, the, let us see what is the Thomson and Epstein classification. Here, as you can see in this particular diagram, type 1 with or without the minor fractures, type 2 with a large single fracture with the posterior acetabular rim fractures, type 3 with combination of the rim of the acetabulum with or without a ma major fragment. So, there has to be combination in type 3. Type 4 with the fracture of the acetabular floor and type 5 with the fracture of femoral head or neck and this has been further subclassified by Pipkin into four subtypes. So, this particular diagram shows you the four subtypes of the Pipkin uh, classification. Now, that here in the type 1 as you can see the femoral head, femoral dislocation of the hip with the fracture of the femoral head corded to the fovea centralis. So, the fracture line passes cordial to the fovea centralis. In type 2, the posterior dislocation of the hip with the fracture of femoral head kephalad to the fovea centralis, above the fovea centralis. And type 3, the type, it may be a type 1 or type 2 with associated fracture of femoral leg. So, there is a fracture of femoral head as well as fracture of femoral leg that becomes type 3. And type 4, it may be either type 1, it may be type 2 or type 3 associated with fracture of acetabulum. So, these are the four subtypes of Pipkin. Now, clinical features, there is usually a history of trauma and the patient has flexion, adduction and medial rotation deformity of the affected limb. Now, there may be a marked shortening and gross restriction of all hip movements. That is most important. Head of the femur will be felt as a hard mass in the gluteal region. And it moves along with the femur. Whenever you try to rotate the femur, you can feel that the movement is transmission to that hard mass felt on the gluteal region. Now, there could be features of sciatic neopalsy. It may be difficult to feel the femoral pulse because now there is no bony support for palpating the femoral artery against which and that is where we call it as a vascular sign of Narath is positive. In fracture, posterior hip dislocation, the classical presentation may not be seen. Coming to the investigation part before reduction laboratory test like the HB percentage, BTCT, blood group or BACTC needs to be done as for any other major surgery. Next investigation of most importance is the radiography, the plain x-ray of the hip. Now all high energy injuries and multiple injury patient should have a screening AP view of the pelvis with both hip joints. Now, what to look for in the initial x-ray? So, first thing you will look for is, are the femoral head symmetric in size? Two, is the joint space symmetric throughout? Three, is the head large? Now, if, if there is anterior dislocation, you can see here in the left side, there is the anterior dislocation of the hip. So, head side appears to be large. And on the right side, there is the posterior dislocation, so the head size appears to be the small. Then look at the greater trochanter, prominence. Now, in posterior dislocation, as you see in the right side, the greater trochanter is prominent, whereas on the left side, where there is anterior dislocation, the greater trochanter is inconspicuous. And reverse is the case in case of the lesser trochanter, as, as we shown by the red arrows in this particular diagram. The another thing which we must look for is the Shenton's line, whether it is maintained or broken. So, in this particular X-ray, you see that on the left side, the Shenton line is maintained, on the right side, it is broken. Then also you have to look for, is there a femoral leg fracture or whether it is a normal. So, the second X-ray shows that there is a femoral leg fracture as well along with the dislocation. After reduction, again, you need to go for a plain x-ray of the pelvis with both hip joint, AP x-ray centered on the affected hip and then Judith's view with the affected hip in internal rotation and external oblique, internal and external oblique views at 45 degrees 
if there is any associated acetabular fracture to find out whether the anterior column of the acetabular is fractured or the posterior column of the acetabular is fractured. Then we also have to look for is there any incasserated osteochondral fragment within the joint and how it is known by looking at is the joint space asymmetry. If there is an asymmetry of the joint space, it means there is something inside the joint creating that asymmetry. Then look for the anterior and posterior acetabular wall. So, Judith view is more useful for that. Look for any indentation on the femoral head. Then use of CT scan. CT scan should be routinely done after a successful or a failed close reduction. The importance of CT lies in assessing the femoral head. Now look in the down below. Here you can find the femoral head. There is a piece fragment inside intraarticular fragment. To demonstrate the presence of a small intraarticular fragment. Then to assess the congruence of the femoral head and the acetabulum. The osteochondral fractures, the occult impaction, indentation and other fractures are very easily seen on a CT. Coming to the MRI, MRI this has its limitation in the acute evaluation of the multiple injured patients. However, as an adjunct to the CT, it helps to evaluate the integrity of the labrum and assess the vascularity of the femoral head. Bone scan, this has a limited uh, and questionable role in the hip dislocations. Coming to the management part, all hip dislocations are emergencies and need to be reduced within 6 to 12 hours following the injury. To prevent the troublesome late complications like AVN and traumatic degenerative hip. Once the reduction is done, urgency is reduced. And now the diagnostic workup, the CT scan and surgical intervention if necessary can all be done once the general condition of the patient is stabilized. Goal of the treatment, the prompt reduction of the femoral head is the ultimate goal. Now this can be done either by the closed means or by open. Thompson Epstein believed that close reduction should be reserved for simple hip dislocation and over reduction for complex fracture dislocations of the hip. While the majority of the authors, they believe that close reduction should be tried initially in all cases of whether it is a simple or a fracture dislocation and over reduction should be reserved for the patients in whom the close reduction has failed or the reduction is unstable after reduction if there are trapped fracture fragments within the joints. Now let us see one by one how do you manage various types of dislocation. So coming to the type 1 dislocation, pure dislocation. Now here the prompt close reduction of the hip is the treatment of choice. Now there are various techniques described in the literature and all these methods can be remembered by using a mnemonic A, B, C's, A for Alice. B for Bigelow's method, C for classical Watson Jones method, and S for Stimson's gravity method. Now, all the reductions should be done under general anesthesia. Please remember, never ever try to reduce the dislocated hip without general anesthesia. Now, let us try to know each method of reduction in little greater details. Ellis method A. Patient is supine. The assistant stabilizes the pelvis by applying pressure on both anterospinal spine. Traction is applied in a line of deformity. So the first picture shows it is the anterior dislocation. The last picture shows it is a posterior dislocation. So you are pulling it in an adducted position. Then the hip is gently flexed to 90 degrees. Once the full traction is applied, then you flex the hip to 90 degrees and hip is now gently rotated internally, externally and continued the longitudinal traction till you achieve the reduction. That is what is the Alice method. Now, Bass has method, described a similar method which we can say that it is a modified Alice method. This is a flexion adduction method with the patient under general anesthesia, the hip is flexed to 90 degrees in maximum adduction. 
as the longitudinal traction is applied in the axis of the femur while the assistant stabilizes the pelvis and the and then we can achieve the close reduction coming to the b b gallows method now the patient is supine the assistant applies counter traction on both anterior and spine surgeon applies longitudinal traction in the line of deformity and then the hip is gently adapted internally rotated and bent on the abdomen now this relaxes the y ligament of big yellow we know it and brings the femoral head near the postural inferior aspect of the acetabulum and by adduction and external rotation extension of the hip the head is levered back into acetabulum now the caution here is the technique should be done with a lot of care as it requires more force and could result into iatrogenic soft tissue damage and fractures. Now coming to the classical Watson Jones method, I would rather recommend you instead of remembering all those methods and techniques and steps, better all of you practice the Watson Jones method. It is the easiest one. Now this technique is useful in both anterior and posterior dislocation of the hip, irrespective of the type of dislocation. The limb is first brought into neutral position and in this position, neutral position means you have to flex the hip and knee to 90 degree and if it is abducted, you adduct it, if it is adducted, you abduct it, bring it to the neutral in the adduction, abduction. Then if it is internally rotated, you rotate it externally, if it is externally rotated, you rotate it internally and bring the, it in neutral as uh, in relation with the rotation as well. And once you achieve the neutral position, the head of the femur will come to lie in a deficit part of the acetabulum from where you can just pull it up and you can have the hip joint reduced. Now this particular picture what is showing is known as Eastern Baltimore's technique of lifting the hip. Now the assistant steadies the pelvis, the head of the femur is reduced by the, uh, into the acetabulum by applying a longitudinal traction in the long axis of the femur and it is simple, effective when compared to the Bigelow's method. The last method is the Stimson's gravity method. In reality, this is the reverse Alice method of reduction. The steps are as follows. One, the patient is prone. Patient is brought to the ease of the table. And an assistant stabilizes the pelvis by applying a downward pressure over the sacrum. And then the affected hip and knee are flexed to 90 degrees. Downward pressure is applied with the flexed knee. And to facilitate the reduction, gentle rotation needs to be done. Internal, external, internal, external like that. Till you achieve the reduction. Now once the reduction is achieved, what is the post-reduction protocol? radiographic verification must be done ap and lateral view of the affected hip and pelvis with ap view should be taken the x-ray has to be carefully evaluated for the concentric reduction by looking for the subtle widening of the joint spaces if there are any significant acetabular fractures judate views are recommended and then most important is evaluation of the post-reduction stability. Now in this diagram, the, the model is being shown uh, here. That lady is like, she is not an actual patient of uh, hip dislocation. However, that is a model to show you how to do evaluate the stability. So a stability check is carried out as follows. Flex the hip to 90 to 95 degrees in neutral abduction and adduction and rotation and a strong posterior force is thus applied. Now if there is evidence of subluxation, telescopy is positive, then additional diagnostic studies are required and the surgical exploration or the traction may be required at a later date. Now the post reduction CT evaluation. Now this is very important and the role of CT has already been discussed. Now the final staging of hip dislocation is carried out. Then post reduction traction, if the hip is stable after reduction, box traction is applied and the hip is, if hip is unstable, then the skeletal traction is applied using the TBLP. Now the permissible weights are 5 to 8 pounds, 
permissible time is two to three weeks or till the hip pain is free hip is pain free and has a good range of movements with traction on the traction requirement it should prevent the hip from flexion internal rotation and adduction weight bearing can be resumed after two to four weeks once the pain and spasm has disappeared now there is a bad news for spica cast the spica cast should not be used for the post reduction stabilization since it prevents the early range of movements necessary to promote healing and it damages the articular cartilage and leads to the post traumatic arthritis in future now coming to the treatment of type 2 type 3 and type 4 now here there is an argument over the closed versus open adduction now most of the authors worldwide feel that the hip dislocation whether it is a stable fracture or not should be reduced at the earliest and this they claim gives a better long term outcome than the operative reduction however the epstein recommends early primary open adduction and he claims better results with this approach however theoretically acceptable practically it has its lacunae as optimum operating condition for the major hip procedure as an emergency uh, procedure is seldom found if the open reduction is warranted it can always be done later after stabilizing the patient without compromising on the long term safety of the patients now whether the choice is a closed or open reduction technique for the posterior fracture dislocation the following factors are prognostically important one degree of initial trauma more the trauma more is the uh, bad prognosis then second the reduction either closed or open should be performed within 12 to 24 hours if it is performed if it is delayed then the prognosis is bad and third if the closed reduction is the choice it has to be attempted only once failing which open reduction should be attempted if somebody uh, attempts more than two or three times uh, try he tries to do the closed reduction then the prognosis is bad now what are the indications for open reduction so the first is failed closed reduction second is failed stability test and third is big posterior leaf fragments then fourth indication is the bone fragments within the acetabulum the fifth indication is fracture of the femoral head and the sixth sciatic nerve palsy now the approach is the posterior approach is favored though some have tried the anterior western jones or the transtrochanteric approach as well now the in technique you need to do the debridement joint is thoroughly irrigated to remove all the pieces of the bones and the cartilage the reduction of the hip is done if it has not been done previously the reposition of the fracture fragments of acetabulum particularly and the head they are done carefully and reconstruct the acetabulum then in the type 2 injuries with the large acetabular chunk it can be fixed with using a single cancellous screw in type 3 with the several pieces reconstruction is attempted accurately as possible and fixation is done with the cancellous screws multiple cancellous screws or a small malleable plates then in severe combination reconstruction is done through the full thickness iliac graft or the autograft in type 4 fractures they are fixed based on the location and the epstein claims poor results in this cases irrespective of the type of treatment you do type 4 fractures they are always have the poor result post operatively the skeletal traction 10 to 15 pounds is applied with the hip in slight abduction and extension within 3 to 5 days once the pain is uh, reduced gentle active and passive exercises in traction remember we are not supposed to remove the traction while mobilizing the hip you must continue the traction and the hip mobilization is done with traction on so that is how after 3 to 5 days you start the hip mobilization now the traction to be maintained for 6 to 8 weeks later protected weight bearing is allowed now let us see the treatment of type 5 the posterior fracture dislocation with the fracture of the head and neck 
Now there is associated femoralate fracture in type 5. We know the first reported by Burkett in 1869. The incidence is 6 to 7 percent. The incidence is on rise due to the increase in road traffic accidents. Now in a dashboard injury, if a hip is in the 60 degrees of flexion or less and is in neutral position, then it could result into a combined dislocation and a fracture of femoral head. This is the aversion of the femoral head through the intact ligamentum teres. Pipkin types here, the posterior dislocation of the hip could be associated with the fracture head of the femur and has been discussed, we have already discussed earlier. Type 1, close reduction is often successful. Pipkin has suggested that close reduction, after the close reduction, the fragment falls back into its normal anatomical position. Surgical excision is advised if displaced femoral fragment obstructs the reduction. That is what Pipkin has noted, that the degenerative changes in the caudal fragment has no bearing in the long term because it is not a weight-bearing part. Then type 2, the Pipkin's type 2, according to Swiatkowski in the type 1 and type 2, if the displacement of the fracture is less than 2 mm on post-reduction CT scan, then primary close reduction is okay. Excision, if the fragment is less than one third of the articular surface, you can always excise the fragment. Then open reduction and internal fixation is done whenever the fragment is very large. Now, this is indicated if the femoral head fracture cannot be reduced by the closed means, the internal fixation is done by the using Herbert screw, a screw which you use to fix the scaphoid fractures. In this injury, since the ligamentum teres is still attached to the head fragment, the blood supply to the fragment is still maintained and it heals well. Now, coming to type 3 where there is a fractured neck femur associated. Now, only 13 cases have been reported in the literature and out of these 5 were iatrogeny happened at the time of performing the close reduction for the hip dislocation. Now, these fractures can be treated as follows. Open reduction and internal fixation of the femoral neck fracture is done first and then the femoral head fractures were treated as type 1 or type 2 whatever may be the case and this can also be treated as a primary insertion of endoprosthesis or other types of arthroplasty. Coming to the type 4, here there is an associated fracture of acetabulum and the fracture of femoral head could be type 1, type 2, type 3. The treatment plan is dictated by the degree of acetabular cartilage damage. Now the small fragments can be excised, the larger fragment needs to be fixed with the screws. The later the femoral head fracture is treated as in type 1 and type 2. Now coming to the complications of posterior hip dislocation. The first and foremost complication is that of myositis ossificans. The incidence is 2%. Now it is seen commonly in the posterior dislocation with head injury and is unknown in simple posterior dislocation. Now it may be seen after reduction also. It can be prevented by avoiding repeated manipulation early immobilization and by immobilizing for six weeks in hip spica. Then coming to the sciatic nerve injury, second complication. The incidence of this injury is 10 to 13 percent. It is three times more common in fracture dislocation than simple dislocation. Usually it is a neuropraxia and peroneal division is commonly affected. It may be due to the stretch of the nerve or may be due to impalement between the fracture fragments. Now, if it is associated with the acetabular fractures, the nerve should be explored and the prognosis is variable. Then coming to the traumatic osteoarthritis. Traumatic osteoarthritis due to the avascular necrosis, that is 35% chances are that the patient may go for AVN. So, for head of the femur, major blood supply enters from the capsule and its lesser extent to the ligamentum teres. Now, if both these sources are damaged, it gradually leads to AVN followed by osteoarthritis of the hip joint. Incidence is about 
the other complication is recurrent dislocation now this is due to the fracture estabulum and sometimes due to the rent in the capsule and the gluteus minimus now this requires exploration and fixing of the acetabular fragments with the screws the another complication is unreduced dislocation now this is commonest in the asian patient due to the ignorance and illiteracy manipulative reduction is tried first and if it is unsuccessful then operative reduction is attempted orthodesis if acceptable is the best treatment total hip replacement is usually not preferred because usually the patient is young then in the hips where there is a useful range of painless movements then the correct osteotomy can also be done in case of the painful stiff hip joint the girdle stone excision is preferred then the final complication is the irreducible dislocation that may happen 31% of the time now this irreduction irreducible dislocation may be due to the bony reasons like acetabular fragments or the femoral head etc fractures or soft tissues because of the acetabular labrum etc causing obstruction for the reduction now it may also be due to coma ipsilateral fracture femur or a dislocation of the opposite hip now it may also require the exploration and open reduction with this we end our discussion on posterior hip dislocation but before we end here i want to talk to you about one more important topic happy key to lose weight dear students one of the commonest problem we are facing in our routine clinical practice is of obesity eat less and exercise more formula for treating obesity has been proved to be the failed formula of late i have been working on the latest most scientific evidence based concept of weight loss happy key you may find few videos on this topic as well on my youtube channel the obesity among the medical student is at its peak nowadays due to obesity not only they are bullied but most of them also lose their self confidence resulting in deteriorating performances in academics for all of them this online video course will be the most valuable if interested you may visit my facebook page the link is given below and you can also visit my website www.drsudhir.com now for the details of this course i recommend you to watch my youtube video as mentioned above the complete link you can enroll for the course you may forward that video to others as well the youtube link is given the youtube link is https semicolon slash slash u to dot b slash m l x capital a i o 8 a e r 4 now my mission is to help more than 10 lakh persons to lose weight and get lifetime freedom from their obesity without dieting and exercises using this happy key technique let all of us come together to create a healthy and fit india thank you thank you all for your patient listening please do subscribe like and forward my videos to all your colleagues thank you very much